Welcome to Menopause Reimagined. I'm your host, Andrea Donsky. I'm a nutritionist for more than 16 years, and I'm in menopause. I'm a menopause educator, menopause researcher, and I'm the co-founder of wearemorphous.com. The purpose of this show is to empower and educate you as you go through perimenopause and menopause so that you can take control of your health and your symptoms. Today, I'm speaking with Dr. Nawaz Habib. He's the founder of Health Upgraded, an online functional health optimization clinic and the host of the Health Upgrade podcast. Dr. Navaz works with individuals who want to upgrade their health, allowing them to have a greater impact and serve more people. Dr. Habib's book, Activate Your Vagus Nerve, is a simple to follow guide to help you identify and address health concerns. By activating the vagus nerve, he teaches how we can optimize our productivity, focus and energy levels, allowing us to experience the effects of upgraded health. Now, here's Dr. Navaz. Welcome to the show, Dr. Navaz. It's an absolute pleasure to be here. Thanks for having me. Oh, I'm excited because we are talking about the vagus nerve. We're talking about the sympathetic, the parasympathetic, all topics that I love to talk about. And I mentioned I talk about the vagus nerve all the time, and I thought it would be great to have somebody who's an expert on the vagus nerve, the gut-brain connection. Let's break it down, and let's talk about why this is important for women as they go into perimenopause and menopause. Yeah, absolutely. It's it's such an important and wide-ranging topic, and uh, it's something that has always kind of been close to my heart. But when I did the research and I started digging into it, I realized there's so much more to this, and and it really is overlooked by a lot of people unfortunately, in our current medical system that we're generally in. Yeah, it definitely is. Okay, so let's start with the definition. What is the vagus nerve? Yeah, very simply, vagus comes from the root word vague, meaning wandering, because when anatomists were testing or checking this thing out, it literally went everywhere. It connected to so many different organs within the body. You can essentially say that every single organ within the body, within the abdomen, and within the uh, thorax, the chest, are innervated, have a connection via the vagus nerve. It connects from the brainstem and comes out kind of just behind the ear, behind the mastoid process there at the center, one on each side. We call it the vagus nerve, but really there's two, two vagus nerves. And they come out and they go down through the neck uh, alongside two very important structures, the carotid artery and the jugular vein. These are the blood vessels that actually bring blood to the brain and uh, away from the brain. And so you can imagine in this tiny little structure on either side, it's containing the two most important blood vessels for getting blood to the brain and away. And it contains this fun little tiny nerve that has been misunderstood for a long time. And that is the vagus nerve. If you find your pulse, you've essentially found your vagus nerve. It's right in front of your SCM muscle mm, here okay. on the neck. Find your pulse. You're right yep, in that neighborhood. It's a phenomenal, simple, easy tool, but it's on both sides. That nerve sends a few branches around the head because it is a cranial nerve. It is the 10th cranial nerve. We have 12 pairs of them that come out. We don't need to get into the specifics, <laughs> uh, but it sends a branch to the ear. Yep. And that's where it actually picks up sensory information on the oracle of the ear. Uh, comes down and sends branches to the muscles at the back of the throat, the pharyngeal and laryngeal muscles. So it actually helps to maintain a good, strong, patent airway. If your airway is collapsing, if your airway is not strong, it's likely a sign that your vagus nerve is not working super well. At least a motor component is not. And so the breath and the breathing patterns really play an important role in understanding what's shifting our state and if vagus nerve is being turned on or turned off. We'll get to breath quite a bit. It then goes down, has a branch, the laryngeal branches go to the muscles around the vocal cords. So that actually pulls and tensions the vocal cords, allowing us to create pitch and tone in our voice. So it's the reason my voice can be really, really low or really, really high. It's because mm -hmm. I can tension those uh, muscles and the, the cords accordingly. So I can raise pitch and tone. You'll often find people like singers that have phenomenal pitch and tone tend to have phenomenal breath patterns and phenomenal vagus nerve tone as well. So mm -hmm. just an interesting little side note, something to keep, keep in mind. Yeah. If you notice uh, somebody has a very monotonous voice, oftentimes there might be an underlying little bit of uh, info there. When I'm working with patients, I'll notice what their, if their voice is very monotonous or not. So uh, an important piece of information here when we're kind of in that clinical setting. Yeah, that's super interesting. As the nerve continues down into the chest, it sends branches 
uh, along the esophagus and then to the, the trachea as well and on the heart and the lungs all get innervated. So essentially we're getting information and sending information between the brainstem and the heart and the lungs. The heart is really important. What the innervation from the vagus nerve does to the heart is it actually slows the heart rate. It helps us get into what we know as the rest and digest state, what we now know as well as the parasympathetic nervous system. So in order to get into that state, vagus nerve has to send a signal to the heart to say, slow down get this going to a calmer state. Let's decrease your heart rate from the 80, 90, 100 beats per minute down into that 60, 55, 60 zone. And that's an interesting sign. This is an easy way to kind of tell what state you're in um, based on your heart rate. So really simply, um, if you have a wearable device like a watch or a ring or something that can track this stuff, you can use heart rate to see, are you in more of a parasympathetic state where you rest and digest is on, you're calm, you're relaxed, or are you more in that fight or flight state, which is a sympathetic side, which unfortunately, more people are in now today than they are, there ever have been at any given time. We have more stressors around us on a day to day basis, whether it's finances, kids, work stuff, uh, sitting too much, working too hard, all the little things that push us to be in that sympathetic fight or flight state. Uh, all the time. So we need to know and your heart rate will tell you. The lower your heart rate, closer to that 50 to 70 zone, the more parasympathetic you are. If it's anything above kind of that 70, 80, 90 zone, then you're getting into sympathetics. Hmm. The heart generally will beat at 100 beats per minute without any innervation. So the vagus nerve helps to bring it down into that optimal resting heart rate zone around 50 to 70 beats per minute. Now, is this for women and men? Yeah, very similar between women okay. and men with regards to heart rate and even heart rate variability. Okay. Um, there's not a huge variation. If it is, it's between a couple beats per minute. It's very minimal. Okay. And are we talking resting heart rate? Are we resting heart rate or are we talking just general? That's general resting heart rate. What's also really important to note is after ac activity, after exercise, after uh a reasonable reason for increasing your heart rate. So let's say you've gone for a bike ride or a run or lifted weights. How quickly can you get back to that resting heart rate? Your ability to get back to that resting heart rate and the speed by which you do so is actually a sign of how resilient your body is. If you're pushing yourself into sympathetic and you're quickly returning to parasympathetic, that's a very good sign. It means that we're a very elastic, very resilient um nervous system essentially, or, or autonomic nervous system. So that's a really important sign. If you've gone out and worked out and it takes you an hour to bring your heart rate back down from 120 down to 70 or 80, that's a problem. That's a sign that you're, you're not able to shift your state as easily. And we need to work on building that resilience uh, sooner than later. So that's a really important I was going to say what define quickly. <laughs> That's what I was going to say, right? So you're basically saying it should be within a, like what a certain amount of time, like 15, 20 minutes, like should it? Yeah. Which Generally, time? if if it comes down within 20 minutes after a rigorous exercise, that's a very good sign. Now, what about when we get stressed? Because, you know, when I, when I asked you before, is it like resting? Is it general? Because for, yes, yeah, so if you're exercising, that's one thing. But what about if you just, you know, have an anxious moment? Yeah. And those anxious moments work very similarly to exercise. They're going to elevate your heart rate. Our bodies are built to um, essentially allow for us to handle stressors effectively. The key is, yeah, it'll go up with those stressors, but can you take some deep breaths? Can you do some work to help bring it down back to that resting heart rate where we get into a zone where we're actually far more competent? It's really funny, but cognitive function is significantly linked to what state we're in. And we think more clearly and we have better blood flow to our prefrontal cortex where our executive function happens when we are in parasympathetic state, when we're in that rest, digest, recover and think and flow state. Often you'll hear people get into a flow state and they're kind of just sitting down, hunkering down and getting work done for an hour and a half uninterrupted and things are just happening really well. But that's a very heavily parasympathetic state because the focus is right on that one thing. And you're doing really quite well during that moment. You can shift and have some ups and downs into sympathetic and parasympathetic, but can you build it back down is the key. So in those moments of stress, 
what I like to do is I like to focus on how do we use the tools that are available to us, the little lifestyle practices and easy utilizational tools that we can that we don't even have to buy. They're literally things that we have incorporated within us already that we can help to bring our uh, heart rate back down and get our state into that parasympathetic state more readily. I want to take a step back for a second. I'd like you to define what sympathetic is, what parasympathetic is, and how are we supposed to be moving and flowing through both? Yeah, it's a great question. We we vilify one side of this uh, quite a bit as well, and I don't think we should. Uh, it's an important state. We need to be able to handle stress. And our bodies have this autonomic nervous system that helps us determine and react to changes in our environment. It's essentially based on evolutionary reasons. We always needed to kind of be aware of and respond to threats to our survival really easily. That's what the sympathetic nervous system allowed for us to do. Evolutionarily speaking, we're talking, and this is a fun joke between all all people in this evolutionary biology side of things, but a saber-toothed tiger would creep up on you and you would get scared and you'd have to run and you'd have to get into something called fight or flight. In those moments, you need blood flow to go to your muscles. You need to have blood flowing to the muscles so that you can either fight the threat <laughs> or run away from that threat. We don't need to worry about digestion in the moment when you're running away from a saber-toothed tiger. We don't need to worry about that when a dog... Uh, barks and scares you a little bit. Our our survival mechanism is go into this fight or flight state when necessary so that we don't die. That's essentially the key here. Yeah. The parasympathetic nervous system is when we're calm, when we're relaxed, when we're able to take a moment and not really worry about those threats. And we should ideally be in that state about 70 or 80% of the time. The unfortunate thing is right now, based on our lifestyles, we're in that state about 30, 40% of the time, most people. We're actually in that sympathetic state far too often. We're in that fight or flight state way too often. And there's been some people out there, Bruce Lipton, a wonderful author, wrote that he believes that 80% of people are in sympathetic state 80% of the time, which is crazy to think. Mm -hmm. If we're doing that, we're essentially worried about survival and we're not allowing our bodies to thrive and recover and overcome the challenges of those stressors readily. It takes time to recover, it takes time to rest, and it takes time to digest our food. And if we're sitting there in sympathetic zone, the digestive system doesn't get the blood flow to be able to do the work that it needs to do. It doesn't get the nervous system in inputs, and that's where the parasympathetic nervous system comes in. Hmm. And you alluded to it before, but so what are ways that we can do to help stimulate that parasympathetic part of our nervous system? Yeah, absolutely. I think I might have overlooked it a little bit, but uh, I mentioned that there's innervation from the vagus nerve that goes down to the abdomen as well. And this is actually what we now know as the gut-brain axis or that gut-brain connection. And every organ within our abdomen has innervation from the vagus nerve. And that's going to signal parasympathetic activation. And it's also, more importantly, sending information up from those organs to the brain. So just a little piece of information I think I forgot to kind of mention could you remind me of the question, if you don't mind? Yeah, sure. So how do we stimulate the parasympathetic part of our nervous system? Yeah, so honestly, the key way is uh, everything has to come down to your breath. Your breath dictates your state. If you are in a calm, relaxed, uh, easy zone, you're going to be in parasympathetic mode. If you're breathing short, shallow breaths, you're going to be in sympathetic zone. And you can actually help dictate that. And we can do a quick... A uh, little example of it right yeah, now, sure. everybody can, just listening. If we put one hand on our chest and one hand on our belly, mm -hmm. and we take three deep breaths, ideally in through the nose and out through the mouth, and keep an eye on which hand is moving when you inhale and exhale. As we inhale, the hand on our belly should be expanding. It should be moving out. And as we exhale, it should be coming back in. We shouldn't have a whole lot of movement in our chest. If we do, if our, the hand that's on our chest is the one that's moving and the hand on our belly is not, then that's a sign that we're using accessory breathing muscles. We're using secondary breathing muscles. Those muscles are utilized only when we're in stress. Only when we're in a sympathetic state. 
So what we can do is take those three deep breaths and focus our attention to use our diaphragm, which is the main primary breathing muscle located at the bottom of the rib cage uh, and actually overlying. It's kind of like the roof to the abdomen. What it's doing is it's with the diaphragm uh, going up and down, we're creating a vacuum in the lungs, essentially drawing air in. But at the same time, we're creating movement and motion in the organs below. And if the diaphragm is not moving, we're essentially saying we're in stress. We need to get blood flow elsewhere. It shouldn't go to the organs below. It shouldn't go to the abdomen. The liver doesn't need blood flow right now. The pancreas doesn't need blood flow right now. We're stressed. Something is threatening our survival. The blood needs to go to other areas. And so it goes to our shoulders and to our arms and to our legs so we can run or fight. Right. So breath is the key here. So taking three deep breaths in through the nose, out through the mouth, or in through the nose, out through the nose. The nose is your breathing tube. The mouth is your eating tube. It's just a backup if you need it, which is great, but should be breathing through our nose. Really important to keep that in mind. So for me, the breath is key. And if we slow everything down and we breathe through our nose and we make sure we're using our diaphragm, that helps to shift our state from sympathetic to parasympathetic. So you mentioned earlier, what happens in those moments when there's a stressor that kind of pops up? Your boss taps you on the shoulder and says, I need to see you in my office. Or your kids are screaming around the house and you're going a little bit nuts. That's my day to day right now, in <laughs> fact. And what do I do to help get myself into that calm state? I take three deep breaths. Right. And slow right. everything down and let it go to the diaphragm. Really helps to uh, create that moment of calm, that moment of relaxation. And allows me to think clearly because it, again, sends more blood flow to my prefrontal cortex, allowing me to think more clearly and be smarter and be more rational and not react emotionally to the situation. That makes a lot of sense. You know, it should be like the first line of defense that we have. So we get stressed. And for so many of us in perimenopause and menopause, I mean, we're we get overwhelmed a lot easier. Right. So it's such a good tool to have that doesn't cost any money that, you know, right away, something stressing us out, family, work everybody, <laughs> you know, everybody's stressing us out at this point in our, in our lives for many of us that we could just literally take the three breaths in the moment, calm ourselves down and, uh, and to kind of stimulate that parasympathetic, you know, it's, it's, what's interesting is I have a daughter, she's 11 and she started playing basketball this year. And before the games, her team, they're so nervous. And I started doing breathing exercises with them. I, I asked the coach, I'm like, is it okay if we just, you know, have do a couple of breathing exercises and visualizations before the game? And we did it. And some of the girls kind of thought it was funny and silly. I mean, you know, you're introducing it to them. And then some of the girls really took it seriously. And one of them in particular, she's one of the younger ones on the team, came over to me after the game. She was with her dad. And she said, you know, Andrea, I just want to let you know, by doing the, that breathing, you really helped to calm me down. Like I was able to play better and I just felt great. And I was like, yes, you know, like it's so great because the earlier we can introduce it to our children, to kids, like to me, it's a tool that they will have for a lifetime. I really didn't learn about it until I was so much older. So it's not like innate, I find for me, but if we can introduce it to them when they're little, oh my God, what a tool, what a gift for them. 100%. I have two daughters, five and almost two. And even at this point, I've already realized the the breath patterns are altered and they're paradoxical and they're using their chest to breathe already. And so just like you mentioned, the sooner we get to teach them those moments and those practices to help get them into that parasympathetic state, the better. So I'll, I'll make sure my daughter knows we want to blow up the balloon in our belly when we take those three deep mm -hmm. breaths, right? Expand that balloon in your belly. You're, you're yeah. pulling in and you're creating this balloon uh, you're blowing up the balloon in your belly, not the one in your chest, the one in your belly. And that really helps to go towards diaphragmatic breath, belly breathing, calming her down. It especially happens like all our kids have meltdowns in their moments, right? And five-year-olds and two-year-olds will have that just like everybody else. And so what we want to do is teach them those practices right from now so that, oh my goodness, when they're 12, 13, 15, 80, when they're having these stressful moments, what can they do to calm it down? I'm going to blow up the balloon in my belly. 
And I find it's one of those things that you just need a reminder. Like for me as an adult, I need a reminder. I'll put it on my phone to remind me for the girls that were playing basketball. What was so great is that their teammates started saying like when they were doing a free throw, they're like, breathe, breathe, you know, or the coaches were like, breathe, slow down. So it's great that it becomes part of that natural routine. I love that. So what are some other ways that we can do that, that other things that we can do that we can stimulate it? We're talking about kids. This is an easy one. If anybody's a parent, especially with younger kids, this is a fun one to do. I mentioned that there's a couple of branches of the vagus nerve that go to the pharyngeal and laryngeal muscles, the muscles of the throat and the vocal cords. And so here's a really easy one, humming. Humming is great. Humming, chanting, uh, singing, it, it's all kind of associated. But I like humming with my kids, especially because right before dinner time, we're often Everything's running around, chaos mm -hmm. is ensuing in our house, and we need everybody to calm down. And so what we do when the time is right or when it's necessary is we have everybody hum and we lay down or we we sit down at the table and we all will take a moment before we eat, before we take a bite, and we'll just go, mm. the joke is we're buzzing like bees and we have to buzz like bees for as long as we can to calm everybody down. What it does is it slows your exhale really pushes you to draw out that exhale as long as possible, mm -hmm. vibrates those mm -hmm. muscles and the vocal cords. These are phenomenal little tools that are activating the motor components of the vagus nerve. That nerve is getting turned on because we're using those muscles that are innervated by that nerve. So it has no choice but to send that signal. Inevitably, everyone will calm down and we'll often at the end of it end up laughing at each other and it's a fun, calm area. And then we can sit down and eat comfortably and have uh, a lot of confidence that we're getting into that rest and digest mode because we're about to eat a meal. And ideally, we'd like to digest those nutrients effectively rather than just have that food pass through us. Bingo, 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 bingo. And uh, again, and I, I keep going back because our because our audience are women and individuals in perimenopause and menopause is that our digestive system changes so much as we go into this phase of life. We're more prone to bloating, more prone, more prone to gas and you know, and, and all of the loose stools, constipation, all of these digestive upsets, we don't digest our food as well or as quickly as we did before. So I think, you know, it's, it's, it's so great because we're so busy, we're running, we're doing like, we're, we're on our phone while we're eating, we're, you know, like, so, and we're eating quickly. That's another thing, right? Many of us are gulping our food. So this is such a great tool. I often say, take a breath <laughs> before you eat. But I love the idea of honey, obviously, you know, if you're not out in public, at a <laughs> restaurant. but you know, I love the idea of just literally humming and, and you have to do it for a certain amount of time. Not necessarily. I, I find that for most people, a minute is sufficient. Okay. Um, calms everybody down quite a bit, especially if it's in a family setting and just, there's a lot of fun. Um, but even three deep breaths are yeah. pretty sufficient to shift your state. And yeah, so each right. person, if you're out in public and you don't want to feel embarrassed because you're humming out and, <laughs> and singing along to the coolest pop song that's out right now, um, just do three deep breaths. And it really just calms you right down and um, puts you into a state where you can digest effectively. And you could do it when you're driving, you're alone in the car. Yeah. Like to me, it's like, it's such a great tool, breathing, humming, whatever yeah. it is. You could do it anytime and it doesn't cost anything, which I think is great. Right. And so yes. just, and it's a reminder, right. And we all, you know, pick your favorite song, pick something that, you know, just makes you happy at the same time, which is another thing that we can do to stimulate our parasympathetic nervous system, laughter, Absolutely. happiness, right. Surrounding ourselves with things that we love. So, all right. What's another tip? I love this. I'm a big fan of taking time for yourself in the afternoon, evening, after the kids go to sleep, that type of time. And I find um, there are certain smells that get people into a calmer state. And essential oil use can be really, really great. Um, if it's possible and you can get into a warm Epsom salt bath and get some magnesium mm -hmm. around yes. you and get yourself <laughs> some uh, candles or, or essential oils, preferably, over candles, um, but have some lavender or have something that's calming to you personally that really just stimulates and you're breathing through your nose and you're smelling all the smells, that's really going to help push you into that parasympathetic zone. Even if it's a once a week type of practice, it's a phenomenal piece of the puzzle. If you're more of a, a challenge yourself type of person, we mentioned breathing. And so if breathing deep breathing as an exercise, for example, like squats, we'd want to make it a little bit more difficult by adding a little extra weight to that squat. So how do we make breathing under stress 
more difficult. Breathing diaphragmatically under stress, more difficult. Well, nothing better than cold. And I'm a huge fan of cold showers and ending your your shower with uh, as much cold as you can possibly handle, letting it hit you at a sensitive area and your body just tightening up and you learning how to handle that stress by breathing through it. Mm. Cold exposure with breath is like adding 50 extra pounds onto the back of your squat. It, it really helps to elevate the ability to handle those stressors, build the muscles, build the, the nervous um, strength and vagal tone to help really allow your vagus nerve to turn on and really learn how to, while you're under stress, shift your state to parasympathetic. It's one of the best tools. I, I don't recommend this to anybody who's got Raynaud's phenomenon or anything where there's uh, a cold sensitivity per se, but something like that where possible for somebody who really wants to challenge themselves cold exposure uh, and breathing through that for 30 seconds to a minute is really good. If you really want to go to longevity purposes with that cold exposure in an ice tub or a cold plunge is phenomenal. If you can get up to like 11 minutes a week would be amazing. Yeah. I, I see so many people on social media that plunging into that cold water and a friend of mine has one of those, I guess the cold baths in his backyard. And I'm like, Oh my God, how do you do that? <laughs> it's like, yeah. And I, so it's interesting that you're saying that you can do that. So I guess it's more, that becomes more of a practice too. Yes. And it or absolutely you can do the shower, but you know, when you're, that's really committing when you're going into like the baths in your backyard. Exactly. And, and a minute in the shower is for most people sufficient. But if you're really interested in boosting for longevity and for for long term health purposes and really creating adaptability, the extremes of temperature regulation going from extreme hot to extreme cold or just getting in the cold plunge, phenomenal tools. I've done five minutes myself after 15 minutes in a sauna, five minutes in the ice mm -hmm. bath. Um, you come out feeling like a million bucks, shivering like crazy, but feeling absolutely phenomenal. The dopamine levels go up like crazy. You just feel phenomenal. It's a really cool challenge. And if you're really up for it, the key is the, the compound rule here. We want to get you compounding it. We want to get it repetitive. We want to get this to be a practice that you utilize on a day-to-day -day basis because you're not going to grow without a, a habitual practice. But you're also, you, you keep mentioning vagal tone. So like anything, it's, it's, takes consistency, right? So you're 100%. building it up, right? It's not something that you have right off the bat. It's something that you build up consistently. And then eventually you're, you're strengthening that tone. That's exactly right. You can't go to the gym one time and expect to have nice gigantic biceps and strong leg muscles, right? Mm -hmm. Your glutes need repetitive work to get stronger. In the same way, your vagus nerve requires repetitive work to keep it strong and keep it toned. And vagal tone is very similar to muscle strength in that particular practice. It needs to be maintained or built up. And so vagal tone is essentially how effectively is the information being passed on the vagus nerve and is it able to shift you into that parasympathetic anti-inflammatory state as easily as possible. Mm. Explain how gargling helps when it yeah, comes to Yeah, gargling is a great, great tool as well. And I'm a big fan of this, especially for people that are having digestive issues. So you had mentioned the bloating and the gas and stuff that can happen when we're getting a little bit older and that happens to males and females, but what do we do to help get that going? Gargling is phenomenal because what it is, is we're learning to breathe while there's water at the back of our throat, while we're stimulating the muscles at the back of the throat. So we're trying not to uh, aspirate that water, get that water into our lungs. We don't want that to happen. At the same time, we're expiring the air out and we're creating like a humming or a gargling sound in our throat. We're essentially hitting kind of the holy trinity when it comes to vagus nerve activation with breath, um, with uh, creating that space in our uh, airway, and with uh, humming or chanting or creating vocal vocalization. So what I'll recommend to my patients is take a glass, keep it by your sink, and every morning, every evening when you brush your teeth, throw some warm water in there. It doesn't need to be warm, uh, but warm or hot is kind of preferable. And throw a little bit of salt in there as well, because the salt will help to break up some of the phlegm and the mucus at the back of your throat. Just help make uh, things a little bit more fun and effective. Stack, stack the habits is what I like to do. Yeah. So go ahead and take a sip of that and hold it in the back of your throat and gargle as hard as you possibly can. It's not like you just go and go, no big deal. 
and then spit it out and say, yeah, I gargled. The key here is, can we get enough electrical activity building up in the brainstem where the vagus nerve comes out that it actually turns on all of the nuclei that are required for vagus nerve function? There's four nuclei. We want to get all of them turned on, not just the motor pieces that go to those pharyngeal and laryngeal muscles. And so if we gargle as hard as we can, we know we're doing it effectively when we start to tear from our eyes while gargling. So holding that as long as we can, anywhere between 15 to 30 seconds is phenomenal, mm -hmm. and spit that out. And then if you begin to tear from your eyes, you know you're getting electrical activity because the electrical activity is then getting to the nuclei that are involved in lacrimation or tearing. So that's a phenomenal way to get feedback as to this is working or I need to do more work to build this up and get it uh, functioning even better. When we talk about vagal tone and you talk about all of these tools, like let's say, for example, gargling, you're doing it in the morning or you're doing it at night, you know, so is this something that, okay, so I'm going to work to really strengthen my vagal tone. I'm going to do my gargling in the morning. And then you notice that there's a shift, let's say, you know, late afternoon, something happens, you get stressed out. Is this where you will see the the change in yourself by strengthening the tone that you may not react as the same that you might have before, like, let's say it kind of goes from zero to a hundred in like seconds. Like now you just might go to zero to 10. <laughs> like, is this why we're strengthening, strengthening, strengthening it? <laughs> For me, the key isn't, are we stopping the stressor from occurring? And are we stopping ourselves from going as far off the deep end as we are? Is it helping us get back quickly enough to make better decisions when the stressor does occur? Mm -hmm. So it's not about how high we get, but it's more about we can get high, but how can we bring it back mm. to where we want to be, where we're making better decisions? And most people are actually making better decisions when there's a little bit of stress. Mm. It, it keeps us on our toes. It keeps us uh, alert, but we're not being hyper emotional and hyper. Um, I don't know what the best word here is, but we're not going off the deep end with our decision making. And so, yes, it may stress us out, but can we pull ourselves back? when the stressor occurs to a point where we can make good decisions. Okay. So kind of like an elastic band, you know, so, so for me, I'm thinking, well, it'd be great too, if it was able to not allow me to go from that zero to a hundred and then just going a little bit less too. Right. But I guess that comes also with other practices, like other practices. as right, well. Exactly. So, and you know, things like meditation, things like yes. walks in nature, these are all, you know, playing with a pet, laughing, watching a funny movie, all of these would play into it as well. 100% because the breath practices and the vagus nerve toning practices are one piece to that overall lifestyle puzzle. I'm a huge proponent of uh, meditation, a huge proponent of visualization and breath work and uh, forest bathing, as we now call it, just mm. going for walks in nature, yeah. having that hyperoxygenation occur. Like there's so many different things that everybody should be doing on, on a regular basis. doesn't need to be daily, but on a regular basis that are helping us to learn that Maybe it's not as bad as we made it out to be in the first place. Maybe there's a better way to think about it. That Those are the mindset shifts. But the vagal toning is how quickly can you rebound? How quickly can you get back to that centered position where you can okay. think more clearly? Before we move on to another topic, is there anything else you'd like to add to the vagal tone? Uh, the last thing that I, I imagine it's likely going to link to the next topic is that vagal tone can be measured and when it can be measured, it can be managed. And so I'm assuming that's where we're going next. Heart rate variability. There we go. <laughs> you read my mind. Yes, let's talk <laughs> about that. I mean, it's a buzzword and a lot of us have heard HRV. What does it mean and why does it matter? Yeah, so HRV, heart rate variability, is not heart rate, does not measure heart rate. Heart rate variability is a measurement of the average change in milliseconds between beats of the heart, okay? So let's say, for example, we have a heart rate of 60 beats per minute, wonderful. But is how rhythmic is that 60 beats per minute? And what is the variation in milliseconds between beats of the heart averaged over a period of time? Heart rate variability is a measurement of the innervation that's a, coming into the heart, telling us to go into sympathetic zone where we're fight or flight, versus parasympathetic. The more variable, the higher the number, the better your health, the more parasympathetic your tone, the more resilient you are, the more elastic you are, the more ready you are to stress yourself out, okay? Mm -hmm. So we do not want our heart 
to be a metronome where it's like a beat and it's happening rhythmically and it's the exact same number of milliseconds between beats of the heart. That's a direct sign that we're actually not resilient. It's a sign that we don't have enough parasympathetic or vagal innervation to the heart telling us that we need to be calm or stressed. Okay. Here's the simplest way to put this. We have two different inputs coming into the heart. One is fast and speeding everything up. And that's the sympathetic nerves that are going to the heart, speeding everything up. And then we have a slow, parasympathetic, vagal innervation that's slowing things down, that's bringing us back. And what that does is it creates variation between how much time it takes between beats of the heart. The more variation, the more back and forth we're able to do, the more resilient our heart and our vagal nerve is. Mm -hmm. And so we're able to handle those stressors more readily. And so measuring HRV is a wonderful way to know what state you're in and every day is gonna be a little bit different and that's okay. It's a wonderful tool that's been used by athletes uh, over the last few decades to help dictate how hard they need to be working that day. Am I training really hard today or do I need to take a day off? Am I really pushing myself with the stressors today or is this a day where I need to like back off and think clearly and not push myself to the nth degree? And that's what we can utilize this tool for on a day-to-day -day basis. Hmm. So what are the numbers? Like I know, you know, for those of us who are listening going, okay, I understand. So our HRV should be higher, um, the higher the reading, the better. Um, but what are we talking about when it comes to those readings? There's different ways of measuring HRV. And so often the numbers can be a little bit skewed between people. And so I'm a big proponent of ensuring that you do not measure your heart rate variability against somebody else, because yeah. Yeah. A, you're going to likely be using a different tool. Yeah. B, it's more, more than likely going to be a completely different way of measuring. And C, who knows what the real numbers truly are. Don't compare yourself to somebody else here. HRV In general, by the way, that's good advice. <laughs> 100%. <laughs> so HRV for me, no question about it, is a measurement of yourself against yourself on a daily basis. Okay. okay? So think of your numbers based on kind of, if you do measure HRV, I'm a huge fan. There's a few different tools out there. I use the Aura Ring. I've used other ones. Oh, There's the Elite HRV uh, finger tool. There's the Polar H7 and H10. These are the ECG kind of chest leads. There's a whoop band. Apple Watch started doing it. They're all over the place. These things are popping up now all over the place. And like I said, because there's so much variation, there's going to be different ways of measuring. So we don't want to compare between. What I recommend here is utilize these tools to compare what you're doing today versus tomorrow versus the day after. Okay. And what the numbers mean is the higher, the better. The higher the number shows up, the more you should be pushing yourself or you're capable of pushing yourself that day. On the days when it's a bit lower, take it easy. Don't push yourself so hard, okay? So simple, but we'll, we'll just kind of go into what those numbers should be. Anywhere between 0 and 20, do not push yourself. In fact, if it's closer to that 0 to 10 number, you should probably go see a doctor. 10 to 20, we're not doing so hot. We need to do some more work to build up some resilience there. We need to kind of work on that. 20 to 40 is a sign that we need a day off. We're not doing so hot. We really should be uh, resting. Don't go and work out that day. If you want, go for a walk, go sit outside, get some fresh air, but don't push yourself. Don't push your heart too hard that day. 40 to 60, we're getting to a point where you're doing a bit better. You could possibly push yourself. You're, uh, you're in a position to uh, elevate your heart rate and really push yourself a little bit more. I wouldn't necessarily go heavy vigorous, in those situations. But again, you're comparing yourself to yourself. So if on a bad day, you're in the 30s, and on a good day, you're on the 50s, then push yourself on the day when you're on the 50s. And on the day on the 30s, don't push yourself so hard. Remember, this is completely relative and completely individual right. uh, when you're going through this. Anything over 60, you're in pretty good shape. Anything over 80, 90, 100, you're an elite, elite athlete. Mm -hmm. And so you're doing wonderfully. Again, Different tools are going to have different measurement ways of kind of doing things, different calculations. So you want to be really specific about comparing you to you with the same tools. This What what role does sleep have on HRV? Sleep is huge. Sleep is where the vagus nerve goes to do its work, right? This is where we recover. 
So for people that are having five and a half hours of interrupted sleep every night, are we really giving it an opportunity to do the recovery work that's required? The answer is probably not. So sleep is key here. Um, in my book, I even mentioned this. Sleep is like the gym for the vagus nerve. It goes to do its work and it requires six, seven, eight hours to do that work. And if it doesn't get to, it's not clearing everything out. It's not getting the gut functioning well. It's not allowing the liver to detoxify. It's not allowing your lungs to breathe out the toxins and your heart to calm down. It's not giving it that opportunity. Sleep is absolutely massive. So I'm a huge uh, proponent of sleep hygiene, sleeping in a cold environment, very dark environment. Um, a big fan of helping, if, if required, supplementation to help get you into that calm zone. Magnesium is wonderful. Mm -hmm. Lavender is wonderful. Um, different melatonin, different I love melatonin, melatonin for those people Amazing. that require it. Absolutely, right? Yeah. So if we need the sleep and we need to push ourselves, there's ways to do that. And sleep is of utmost importance to vagus nerve function, vagal tone. Think of it in this very simple way. Yeah. I have this awesome analogy. Our autonomic nervous system is like a car. And we have two ways to have this car move. We have the accelerator, which is the fight or flight mechanism, the sympathetic side of things. And if the car is... It doesn't make any sense to have a car that doesn't move. So we need to have that sympathetic drive to make us go. But we also can't have a car that doesn't have brakes. That car that doesn't have brakes can go off and create damage and a lot of uh, issues around the world. So what we want to do is make sure that we have good, strong brakes. And the brakes are the parasympathetic vagus nerve activated vagal toning system. That's what we need to have is a balance between the accelerator and the brakes. So we have to know when to push the accelerator when the light's green, ideally. And we need to know when to push the brakes and when to press park and turn off the car. And that's really what we need to have here is a balancing point between the sympathetics and the parasympathetics. And knowing when to push the accelerator when your HRV is high because the brakes haven't been worn out. And if the brakes have been worn out, then your HRV is going to be pretty low. Or you're going to have signs of inflammation in your body. You're going to have signs of stress wearing down your body. One huge component of this parasympathetic nervous system that's run through the vagus nerve that I haven't really had a chance to get into is that it controls inflammation in your body. It is the controlling arm of how our immune system produces inflammation to help either push us into an inflammatory state when it's not working or to keep us out of inflammatory state when it is working. The vagus nerve sends signals to every organ in the body, affecting the immune cells that are present in that organ, telling them to tone down and go into homeostasis, to go into calm, relaxed, stress-relieving mode, and it shuts down inflammation. So when the vagus nerve is not working, this is where we get into autoimmune conditions. This is where we get into detoxification and gut-based issues and immune dysregulation and histamine issues and mass cell activation and RA and MS. And so all of those things come as a side effect of uncontrolled inflammation. The vagus nerve controls inflammation in the body. Again, you know, we're so prone to inflammation. So if this is another tool that we can have in our toolbox that helps us to reduce that inflammation, that's incredible, right? Yeah. To do that, that, that vagal tone. I, I wanna talk about traumatic brain injury for a minute. Yeah, absolutely. Because I want to, I want to understand what the connection, my mom had a traumatic brain injury six years ago, and she is still suffering with the lightheadedness and issues around it. So, and I know she is going to want to hear this interview. So I want to ask you this question. And for anyone else who has had traumatic brain injuries, especially as we get older, it takes longer for our, our brain to heal. And we might have other side effects that come with it. So I thought I would love you to talk about that a little bit. Yeah. I'll, I'll talk about it with regards to a case. I had a really wonderful uh, patient of mine who had multiple concussions. She was a skater, um, quite well known, but we're not going to get into that, obviously, um, but had multiple falls on the ice and bumped her head significantly, mm. I think eight times over her career. Wow. And with each time had significant migraines, had significant TBI based symptoms, autonomic dysfunction, gut dysfunction, et cetera all these challenges kind of popped up accordingly. With TBI and concussion, what we're looking at is a direct blow creating inflammation at certain areas. And it can happen internally within the actual um, casing of the brain, 
but we something that we don't often realize is the shearing forces and the axon injuries to the neurons in in their CNS happen primarily at the brainstem, which is where the roots or the neuron or the nuclei of the vagus nerve are. And so we'll often find that as a result of a TBI or concussion for months and years afterwards, we can have autonomic dysfunction, which is the vertigo, which is the inability to manage inflammation levels, which is all of these specific autonomic dysfunction yeah. type situations where our bodies are shifted to sympathetic mode way more easily and the brakes are essentially torn off the car. That's essentially the way to think about these things. And so what it essentially is creating is physical damage to the nuclei associated with vagus nerve. And so we need to do these practices, those foundational practices I talk about, but there's tools that we can utilize that are coming out more recently, which uh, you're one of the first people to hear about this, which is pretty awesome. But there's vagus nerve electrical stimulators that are now coming out that are phenomenal for helping to drive improvements and repair in those particular areas. This is where um, a lot of research has been done. There's some really positive stuff coming out with regards to vagus nerve stimulation, mm -hmm. using electrical stimulation to the cervical ones. I've got actually one sitting right in front of me, funny enough. This oh, is an electrical cool. stimulator okay. I'm a huge fan of. Okay. This guy's coming out in the next couple of weeks, which is really exciting. I'm kind of early to the game, but these are phenomenal because you find your pulse, you go, you hit that spot with an electrical stimulation that's not painful. And what it does is it helps to improve vagus nerve activation. And these okay. are at home. That's an at home device. This is an at home device that is super, super easy to use. And so, where can you get, where can we get that? If it's going to be out in a few, if people want to learn yeah, more about it. Best website is gamma core.com G A M M A C O R E.com. Okay. Um, if you're in Canada, the U S it'll be a little bit different, but okay. um, there's options. So gamma core is a company that sells this particular device. There's a few other ones out there, but I'm a really big fan of this one because it's easy to use two minute stimulation and it has phenomenal research behind it. So would that replace doing all the other things you talked about? Like, or, so, okay. So explain. I wouldn't say it replaces it. It certainly is going to augment and nothing is going to be quite as strong as electrical activation, but ideally you don't need to be doing that on a daily basis, right? Okay. These are great little jumpstart kickstart things for somebody who's got a TBI or concussion or somebody who's got okay. pretty significant issues from an inflam inflammatory or autoimmune type condition. This is a great way to augment that. So what I actually have people do when they're stimming, and I have a few people that have utilized this, including that lady that I told you about okay. um, who utilized this and had significant improvement uh, after about 12 weeks of using that particular device. And uh, what we found was that stacking therapies together. So while she's stimming, she's humming, or while she's stimming, she's deep breathing, mm -hmm. doing them together, and then still having the practices of gargling and uh, cold showers and deep breathing outside of that help to augment the repair of that vagus that nerve sense. tract and those nuclei. Yeah. So this is a great tool because it's going to really jumpstart it. But ideally, you don't need to hook up your car uh, batteries to somebody else's car to jumpstart it every single time you want to turn it on, right? You want to rebuild it, rebuild that foundation using those exercises and this is a secondary tool when necessary. You mentioned that you were helping your patients. Can you explain how you practice your chiropractor? How do you help people if they're interested in learning more and they want to work with you? I know you're based in Canada and a lot of our listeners are in the US, but explain how they can get in touch with you or, or work with you if they wanted to. I consult with people worldwide uh, through my company called Health Upgraded, which is an online health consulting company. Essentially, we work with our clients worldwide, Canada, US, uh, and internationally to help support their overall lifestyle growth holistically. Um, we practice functional medicine, we practice holistic nutrition, and we augment a lot of that with vagus nerve activation mm -hmm. exercises and vagus nerve stimulation. Mm -hmm. And so we're in the process of building out uh, some group programs, which I think would be really beneficial. And uh, we're also in the process of doing one-on-one -on -one care with a lot of people, That's a couple awesome. that I mentioned here as well. So you can find us at healthupgraded.com okay. and you can follow me on Instagram at Dr. Navaz Habib, probably the easiest ways to do that. And if you liked this, then the book is a great little tool to help get you uh, a little mm -hmm. bit more understanding with regards to the vagus nerve and what causes it to go wrong and what we can do to improve it. 
Yeah. And I'm, we're going to put links to everything below. So any, you know, if you want to work with Dr. Navaz or you want to buy his book or you want to know about his gamma core, I think you said, I'm going to put links to everything below so you can find it really easily as well as your Instagram and your website. So thank you. This was amazing. Is there anything else that you want to add before we end today's interview? I think probably the only thing I'd like to add is that I've, I've been able to help enough people to know that our bodies are super resilient when we give it the opportunity to repair itself, when we give it the opportunity to become elastic again and get back to resilient recovery based states, and we allow ourselves that patience and that time, we can really recover and, and optimize our overall health. I've seen it happen time and time again, when people are willing to put in the effort and put in the work to take their health to that next level. I love that. Great way to end the interview. I always say there are things out of our control, but there's a lot that's in our control. So it's uh, ending on a positive note, which I love. Thank you so much for doing the interview today. It's my absolute pleasure. I hope today's interview helped to answer any questions you might've had regarding the vagus nerve, the sympathetic part of our nervous system and the parasympathetic. If you enjoyed today's conversation, please share it because the more you share shows you care and please rate and review our podcast. I would be very grateful if you did that. As always, thanks for listening and I'll see you at the next interview. 